Imagine yourself trapped in a school. 14 days, no food, no water. How will you survive? Mayhem and madness unfolds. Will they get out or wither away? Coming to a multi-purpose room near you. Get your tickets now for a buck. They're stealing our food. Kill them! In March of 2022, the video and animation students of Greene County Career Center were tasked with making and producing their very first film. Things went right and things went wrong, but at the end of the year, the movie was scrapped during its final stages of completion and banned entirely for the summer. Now, we take a deep dive into the production and colossal failure that is buried in. Pre-production for the film began during March of their junior year. The class consisted of 13 kids and their teacher, Mr. Bargdale. The idea for the movie began with the brainstorming phase. The team was tasked with coming up with ideas for the short film, which needed to be completed by the end of the school year. With such little time to produce their film, the team was already under tremendous pressure. No class has ever uh, made the schedule. Um, we talk about it and we, we build it as if they um, are putting things together. But in the, the junior high uh, grade, the, the students, almost 60, 70 percent of the students in, in junior in the 11th grade don't have a lot of experience with time management, um, don't have a lot of experience with workflow, creating a good workflow and developing the, the workflow so that it uh, ends at the right time. And that's a very difficult task when it comes to multiple people from different backgrounds and trying to get them to um, adapt to that kind of situation. So the lesson actually is really about working together as a team and learning how to resolve situations and move forward and also how to deal with uh, creative collaboration, which is in the industry becomes a very difficult piece of uh, everyday life when it comes to somebody working creatively in the, in the industry. The concept for the film originally started as a horror movie about a group of teenagers getting trapped in their school who would have to fight to survive. This idea went through many changes leading up to the writing of the first draft by students Dylan Picola and Alex Davis. So I was one of the two main writers for the, the story, me and Alex, and we kind of like came up with like the entire plot line, the, the name, the characters, like pretty, pretty much like how it is now. That was like us who uh, impacted that. It wasn't a bad experience. I'd already kind of liked um, writing to begin with, even though I hate reading. But I figured I'd have a really good time with it because I do enjoy a bit of storytelling and the process for it. It was very, it was kind of strenuous in a way, but I didn't exactly um, come to hate it entirely. I mean, we would sit there for a very long time. We weren't exactly as organized as we should have been, but you know, we got it done. And at the end of the day, we would present it to the whole class and they would put their, get their input in to ask questions. I wanted to make sure that the story, like everybody was okay with it. They knew what they were doing. They're like, yeah, we can, we can make a movie out of this. Nothing like too like an extreme or whatever. So I kind of like, you know, just like fought him with Alex. We're like, yeah, I think this could work as a story and like the name and everything, the character personalities. I mean, we wrote the story that we were supposed to write, but at the end of the day, uh, I mean, the story is like the main backbone for the whole thing and the film wasn't finished. So what does that say about the story itself? Not to mention the acting within it, like the, the acting that, the acting that was supposed to match with the writing itself, what didn't exactly work out the way it should have. The final concept for the plot was a group of teenagers who decided to stay overnight at their school for a challenge, only for things to go south when a blizzard hits the school, leaving them to survive with their limited resources and each other. This is where problems of the movie began. An incoherent script led to lack of direction for the genre of the film, which caused much confusion during all phases of production. While some still believed it was a horror film. Others seemed to believe it was a comedy or a drama. In preparation to begin filming, the team began learning how to use the new equipment. They learned how to use higher quality film cameras, which they had previously had very little experience operating. Along with that, they had to learn to fit everything they needed, including all microphones and audio equipment, cameras and lenses, and all the cables they needed to run the equipment, 
and a laptop with enough storage to hold all the data from the film onto two tiny carts. While the writers were hard at work developing the script for the upcoming project, the rest of the class was busy learning how to direct on set and frame the shots in an appealing way. During this time, the team decided on the roles they would take on set. It was decided. Justin Laid was chosen as director for the film. Remy Reynolds as the camera operator, Hunter Atkinson as the boom mic operator, William Reed as the main audio operator, and Alex Stepp as the lead production assistant. Once the writers were finished with the script, the auditions for the actors began. The characters were as follows. Sean Hall, an ordinary lead protagonist who stays logical throughout the movie. J.J. Clark, the best friend who isn't serious about the situation at hand. Howard Nelson, the main antagonist who is a computer nerd and bully throughout the film. Diana Collins, the mean girl with a selfish survival plan and a negative demeanor throughout the film. Roy Sanchez, the stereotypical airhead jock who was laid back throughout the film. With only five main characters written for the film, the competition between the seven auditioners was tense. Though, for most of them, it was their first time ever auditioning for a role. I sort of decided last minute that I didn't want to be a background person. Like, I wanted to do something other than just holding a microphone or like being a cameraman or something. I felt pretty confident auditioning. I mean, I've auditioned for things before. It was a pretty different experience because I'm used to doing like the background stuff. But this time I got to like be in front of the camera and like, I don't know, just do something different. So it took a lot of getting used to. I was confident a little bit. And then I was like, as soon as I got on camera, I was like, okay, what am I doing? Everybody was really scary. After much competition, the lead roles were decided. Braden Grosh as Sean Hall, Alex Davis as J.J. Clark, Logan Orcutt as Howard Nelson, Samantha Castillo as Diana Collins, and Samuel Wright as Roy Sanchez. I originally wanted to be Roy or J.J. It didn't really matter who. I didn't want to be a main character. I've never been an actor before. So I just wanted to step in, not all the way, but I ended up getting picked by my classmates to be the main character. No, I wanted to be JJ. Like, I, well, I pretty much just wanted to be anybody other than Roy. So I auditioned for JJ Clark and um, I ended up getting JJ Clark. Yes, I did get the role I auditioned, I auditioned for. Well, he's supposed to be like a stupid, but like strong jock guy, but I'm just stupid and normal. I mean, I'm not a great actor, so maybe that helped with sounding like not smart, but Roy is supposed to be kind of an idiot, so not knowing my lines would kind of help his character. He's kind of immature within the film, and um, I'm kind of like that now, <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, it wasn't getting in character that was a problem. It was the fact that there was one time where we were doing a scene that was uh, like over here, and uh, we had to do it seven million times, and I could not figure out why I was doing it wrong, and I never did it right, and that made me really hate the entire experience itself, was just the scenes that I was in. If I could pull myself out of it, I definitely would. I felt like he was a very blank person. For the protagonist, he didn't have a lot of character. Like, even some characters like J.J. and Roy had a lot more character than he did, and it just messed up the film. I think Brayden's role uh, was really intimidating. I originally think I wanted um, to be, uh, I think, Brayden's character, I think the main character. And then they're like, I did like a nerdy voice and they're like, that's perfect. And everyone liked it, so. Haley Williams, Adam Copel, and Dylan Piccola also played as extras throughout the film. I was more of a background character, like for auditioning. I. I think I tried to audition for like a different character, but got a background role. Even though I didn't like get the main role, I still felt like it, I did a good job, even though it wasn't exactly perfect as I was a little bit clumsy in mind, but I could have done better if I had like more confidence. While the actors may have thought that this would be their big break, it turned out to be the beginning of the end. Having completed all phases of pre-production, the team began filming at the beginning of April. With only a month to get all the footage needed, they were set on a tight schedule, leaving little room for mistakes. However, this would prove to be impossible for the students, as they would have to juggle a multitude of unfathomable mishaps. The first of many issues began when they simply tried to leave the classroom. The carts they had filled up their equipment with were big and unwieldy to move. This made transporting them a chore to everybody involved. So with the film, they learn how to use the AJ Scion 4K cameras. 
Um, they roll a dolly cart. Uh, they actually have a focus pull and they have different lenses, so different um, types of lenses for close-up shots and long shots. And then they also have an audio board, a Behringer, um, I think it's an eight channel uh, mixer. Uh, they have a laptop that they record all the audio into. Uh, boom poles, which connect to the camera to do um, uh, room sound audio to time things up to. And everything like props, um, you know, all those other little things we carry in the cart. Uh, the cool thing was your guys' class <laughs> got everything on the one littlest cart ever, <laughs> which was kind of humorous for me because normally there's so much that's spread out. So there's like three or four different carts moving normally with us. And um, I think we just had the one cart and the dolly, and the dolly really was just, you know, there for there never was anything on it. It was just everything went back to that cart, so. Even once they had made it through the door, the trouble didn't end there. They would have to lug these metal burdens across the school. And even after that, the nightmare of moving the equipment was still not over. Their classroom was placed on the second floor of their school, and many of their filming sets were on the first of the building. This meant they would have to fit these huge carts under the tiny elevators, on top of that, the class would have to wait for Mr. Bargdale to unlock the elevator for them. This seemingly simple task would end up taking minutes out of their precious time on set. Once the tedious process of transporting the equipment was done at last, the camera crew would finally be able to set up their gear. Although this process was even worse than the transportation. Setting up the equipment would take up almost an hour of their limited time, and even more of their energy. The longer it took for them to set up, the more exhausted they would become and the longer the day would feel. They would have to find a place within the given set to plug in the audio card. Once that was done, they would have to set up the camera and tripod. The tripod had to be secured perfectly or else the camera worth thousands of dollars would fall to the ground and break, leaving them out of luck. Once the crew was finished setting up the camera, they would finally be able to start recording. To begin filming, the director would say scene in and the production assistant would bring in the clapboard and call the scene. Once it was called, the director would say scene out and the production assistant or the PA would leave the scene. The director would then call standby and when everyone was ready, he'd call action and the scene would start. It was not very horribly challenging, but it was not the easiest thing either. Um, there was a lot of things I had to get used to. Um, and as well as, it was also my peers, so it felt kind of strange, I guess, bossing them around, but I, I wasn't really bossing them around. Once the action started, the actors would say their lines and move where needed. This was not an easy task because the scenes had to be performed correctly multiple times for the different camera angles. The lack of experience from the actors mixed with the complexity of the scenes led to each scene taking longer than anticipated. Other complications with scenes arose when actors weren't at school during a day of film. Improvising was a common practice for the director and the film crew. The scenes recorded would not be reviewed until the post-production part of the process. It would be the job of the film director and the audio operator to make sure the scenes looked and sounded good from their perspective. The worst part? Uh, I think many times I... Um, <clears throat> I had a hard time um, direct, I mean, honestly, just directing people and like putting my foot down and having an idea of what I want to do. And then uh, I guess instructing people on how to do it. It was very hard for me to, I guess, kind of, uh, you know, get what I want done. Um, and I felt like I was bossing people around a lot, um, which may or may not have been entirely true. I don't know. Um, uh, and also I don't think it helped that I had little to no experience doing this. Um, and so it was very, uh, confusing and overwhelming. After filming was done for the day, the students would clean up the location and all of their equipment to prepare to move it back to the room, doing the same long-winded process as before. The locations for every scene were different places around the school. While there were many places to choose from, all of them would have issues of their own. My responsibility was to let go. Um, there's a couple of times that I jumped in and I even apologized for interfering. Um, and that's, that's something that I've built by design. <clears throat> if, if I end up 
taking over and guiding, then we're not learning from the, the hardships that we have to learn from. So it's hard for me to stand back sometimes and actually watch stuff fail, uh, especially when it's something that I'm very passionate about and connect it with. Um, but um, the, the one thing that I've had to do over the last six years is to take myself out of the picture as much as I could. Um, if, if I'm telling somebody how to do something, they're not learning how to do it. If they do it and they fail and then they make changes and make adjustments, then they're learning how to do it. And if they ask for help, I'll provide the help. But it's best if somebody sometimes learns from mistakes. And when you're making a film, it's just this massive, huge ball of chaos. And it's hard to navigate through that because there's so many departments in each phase of it. You, like you have pre-production, production, post-production. Post -production. So each one of those departments has a large amount of different tasks that have to be done. And so there's so much going on. <clears throat> it's best to just kind of jump in, learn from some, some mistakes, make some changes. Uh, we talk about it. We talk about our film ratio and how we can improve. And then we usually just have a discussion at the end, and I think that is kind of like the best way for this project. So different sized locations made it, would sometimes make it very difficult to record audio. Um, so for some rooms, we'd be in these like huge spaces. So scenes where we're in like the multi-purpose room, um, that was always really frustrating because it's just this big open space and there's so much room for just reverb and echo. And then there's other spots where we're in the cafeteria where it's the same thing. It's just a big empty space with not a lot of, you know, people in it to absorb sound. Um, but then other scenes when we were like in the control room, that's such a small space and there was a lot of people in there. So um, there's also a bunch of soundproofing just loose in there. So that would help absorb a lot of the echo. Um, yeah, and then also another thing was outside. That was like had the problems. It wasn't echoey outside because your sound just kind of dies when you talk. Um, so we didn't have to worry about echo there, but there we had to worry about a lot of other things like uh, wind, cars driving by, um, some of the other labs, they use like lawn mowers or like golf carts or just something to like move around. Um, and that was very frustrating. So a lot of those scenes we had originally planned to just replace uh, in post. And uh, what ended up being the issue with that is that since we never we never had the time to do that, so um, a lot of those scenes where they sounded really bad, we needed to replace the sound just in post and with uh, microphones in one of the audio booths. Um, but we never were able to get around to that since the movie never got finished. Prior to filming, the director and other crew members were sent to go scout out possible locations for the film and scenes. Some of these locations were planned during the writing part of the film, so this was an easy task. However, this would become the only easy task involving the locations. As mentioned before, all of the equipment had to be transported to locations for the film that day. After transporting all of it, it would be the job of the director and videographer to figure out how to make each spot work in the space given. I went with the director and we walked around the school and looked for the best places with um, good lighting and pretty much just like figured out what places would be good. We had to improvise a lot. Um, it was very much affected by the location we were in. Um, uh, I know for a fact me and Remy, we like had stuff on paper and in our heads and how we thought it would go, but when we'd get there and we scattered it out, it was like, this is not going to work. Uh, uh, and so we really had to adapt to that. Wires and equipment haunted the location as the team attempted to get scenes without interruptions. However, recording during active school hours made this nearly impossible. People having to walk into, out of, or pass by the locations chosen would often stop production as a whole for moments, if not minutes. Trying to get clear-cut audio would also prove to be an ongoing disaster. At the beginning of May, once all the assets for the movie were collected, the team began the post-production phase. With less than a month of school left to finish the project, they began to really feel the pressure. The editing of the movie was split up among the class, with everyone in the room taking different scenes to edit, before all the scenes were combined by the master editor. I volunteered to be the master editor thinking more people would, and I ended up getting picked as a master editor because no one else did. 
So I spent a lot of my time near the end of the school year trying to finish the film before we ultimately decided to give it up. This led to even more inconsistency in the storytelling. Since everyone had different skills and ideas for editing, the scenes clearly looked like they were made by different people and simply stitched together. This, along with many people not syncing up the audio and video properly, resulted in an overwhelming amount of work for the master editor. Just all the pressure on me to finish it before two weeks. Even once the editor had all the scenes in place with the proper audio, his work still wasn't over yet. During pre-production, the class had a lot of ideas for what they could do for special effects. The editor became quickly overwhelmed with the load of work he had to complete, and this was still not the end of his tasks. Uh, I had hopes, but once I got to like halfway through and I seen all the stuff that I needed to finish, I just, I kind of gave up hope. While the editor was busy mending the seams of this torn quilt of a movie, the music director was hard at work creating the score for the film. Justin Laid, who had also directed the movie, was the man in charge of composing the music for the film. This was one of the best things to come out of the film. Justin's previous experience with playing various instruments, which made him a great candidate for music director. He created eight songs to accompany the film. These songs added a lot of much needed liveliness to the film. I wanted to make something uh, I guess I just wanted to make music for the short film, something that would accurately like be in a short film or in a movie in general. Uh, I guess my mindset was kind of like I, I'm doing this for myself, but also uh, I want I want to make it pretty good. You know, I want to have like to say I, I put like actual effort into this. Even though the score made the movie much more bearable to sit through, this also meant even more work for the editor. With all these tasks stacking up for the editor, he began to feel overwhelmed. Eventually, the team cracked. They decided to throw in the towel and give up on the project. I feel like everybody didn't want to finish the movie, and that kind of just ended up making it not get finished. I'm, I think it's for the best because, I mean, I was in it and I still don't want to see it and I don't think anyone else that was part of the movie wants to see it. By the end of the school year, the team was worn out and stretched thin. They had been through numerous errors and problems, leaving them stressed and ready to be done. The movie was over. They had worked until their fingers were worn down to the bone. They had reached their breaking point and couldn't go any further. It was too much for them to handle. Although the original team never put together a complete copy of the film, a fan of the project, Joseph Bargdale, decided to assemble his own edit of the movie. Locally called the Bargdale Cut, it edited out much of the slow pacing and weird dialogue. Even with this dedicated fan's changes to the film, the movie was still nonsensical and not very entertaining. After all the hard work the team had put in, the movie was a failure. The team walked away from the project in shame, like a scared puppy with its tail between its legs. Their pain was meaningless, and their stress was in vain. And unlike the great Howard Nelson, they regretted everything.